What's up guys, it's Mars from Audio Judgment and today we are going to discuss measurement microphones. We got a lineup of five microphones, from the cheapest one to the most expensive. If you have a keen eye, you notice that there are only four. That's because I borrowed the fifth one. You'll understand in a minute why I use those air quotes. Measurement microphones need to be recalibrated after five years. I don't know why exactly that's the case, but I'm guessing that the measurement capsule in front of the mic ages and the frequency response suffers. The microphone I use is this one, which is a pretty top-notch microphone. Coincidentally, it's getting close to the five-year age mark. As a result, I bought another one, brand new, just to compare them directly and see how age affects a microphone. You do realize that I bought this mic for the sole purpose of making this comparison and then immediately return it. I don't particularly feel bad about what I did because it was already an open box and because it's for science. Now, besides the price differences, there are some particularities about these microphones. All of them come with a calibration file except for the cheapest one. A measurement mic ideally has a ruler flat frequency response. In reality, it will have some variations from a perfect straight line. So for example, if a specific mic has a plus 1.5 dB at 875 Hz, in the calibration file, you will see minus 1.5 dB at 875 Hz to compensate and keep the response flat. This file will contain all of the corrections for all the frequency spectrum of the mic. This file is specific for each individual mic. So to get this file, you usually go to the manufacturer's website, enter the serial number of your mic, and then you can download your file. In theory, the file should be updated every five years. You need to send your mic to a company that can calibrate microphones, and you will get your fresh and updated file. The Behringer microphone doesn't come with a calibration file at all, so it has to rely on its own raw performance, and we shall see how it will fare against all the other microphones which do come with the calibration file. Most of the people ask me if this mic is good enough because it's so cheap. After we'll do this comparison, I can respond to that question with a high amount of certainty. Another outlier in this mic uh, lineup is that all of the microphones are XLR and only one is a USB microphone. USB mics are pretty popular and that's pretty frustrating to me because I don't like them that much. So here's why I prefer XLR mics instead. XLR microphones need phantom power to work. As a result, you need to buy an audio interface. If you go with a budget microphone, uh, with a calibration file, the XLR mic will be cheaper than the USB one. However, when you add the audio interface, it will be more expensive. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that even though you pay a bit more, you get so much more value. In both cases, you get a measurement microphone, which you will basically use for some acoustical measurements and then forget about it. However, in the XLR mic case, you are left with the audio interface, which can be many things. Need an external sound card? Guess what? You got one. Got some studio monitors? You can't hook them up directly to your laptop because you need some sort of preamp. Good thing we already have one. Maybe you want to start a podcast or need to record good quality audio and need a microphone preamplifier. Well, wouldn't you know it? You already have one. Got some 6.3mm jack headphones? Hook them up because this is a headphone amplifier as well. I'm not going to mention that you can hook up instruments to it because not many people do that. But this is awesome and it's portable as it's USB powered and you can make good use of it. Not just a simple measurement mic that you use a few times and then let it collect dust. The things I've just said have nothing to do with acoustical measurements and pretty much they both can do the same things, except for one, using a timing reference. It's not that the USB can't do it, it's just that it's the same process is different and a true burden. Now I'm not going to bore you with what a timing reference is, I'm just going to describe a case where you would want to use one. 
For example, you want to measure the anechoic response of a ported subwoofer. I'm going to use a ported enclosure as a device under test. To do that, you need to make a near-field measurement of the speaker, a near-field measurement of the port, and do some mathematical mumbo-jumbo to scale them correctly, and finally add the two responses together. Now, if you don't use a time in reference, the phase will not be correct, and when you will add them together, you will get some weird results. So here's how it works. When you click take a measurement, depending on your microphone position, it will take a certain amount of time from the point you click the button and the sound reaching the microphone. And the software doesn't know how long it takes. When the sound reaches the microphone, that is considered to be time zero. And this is fine and dandy if you want to do some random measurements. But if you want to add two responses together, timing is important. You can imagine when you measure the port, when the speaker starts to move, uh, it will be the first one, and after some delay, then the air inside the port will start to move as well. And this delay is not taken into account. How do we fix this? We use a loopback cable. You need a two-channel audio interface for this. So if you buy one, don't buy a single-channel one. One output is used to power the speaker, and one input is used to connect to the mic. And with the other two connections, we just use a loopback cable to connect them together. Now when we do the measurement, we just select Use Loopback as Reference. And that's it. Now when you click Take a Measurement, the signal through the loopback passes instantly. And that will be considered time zero. The reference is the same for both measurements of the speaker and of the port. As a result, we know the time difference between the two and we can accurately generate the phase response. Now, when it comes to USB mics, you obviously can't connect a loopback cable, but there is a way around this. Stay focused, as the process is not straightforward. You get a second speaker and place it close by, but make sure you don't move it while making the measurements. Hook it up to some output of your computer. Also, make sure it's a high-frequency driver like a tweeter or a mid-range. A subwoofer won't work. After that, when you do the measurements, select acoustic timing as reference. Now, when you do the measurement, a signal will pass through the second speaker and will reach the mic at exactly the same time as the second measurement and will be used as reference. When you measure the port, make sure you don't move the mic to the port move the port to the mic because you need to keep the mic and the second speaker in the same place for both measurements. This is more complicated than it needs to be. With a simple loop back, you don't need an additional speaker. You don't have to worry if you move the speaker or the, or the mic. It's just way easier. And let's take a look at the measurements to show you what I mean. So just to prove the point, I have here uh, the Base reflex box measured with and without an acoustic reference. So here we have the near field uh, measurement of the speaker and of the port. And uh, when you add them together, you should get something predictable like this. Now, even though you have to do some scaling to this response to get the actual correct response, uh, we are only looking if the addition of these two responses is resulting in something predictable. Now we have this resonance over here, but this is just something because I forced the port inside, it's not sticked to the box using, I usually use silicone or something like that. But let's look at the other two responses, which you can see are the same as these ones, because they overlap perfectly. But when you add them together, you get this mumbo jumbo. Now, if we look at the addition of these two responses, we can see that around 100 Hz, the, they are out of phase and they cancel and form this dip. Now, this is not correct. This happens because the phase is inaccurate and we get this result. So now my rant about USB mics is done. Let's move on to comparing the frequency response of the microphones. So the setup is pretty simple. I just have the speaker on a stand and I did some far field measurements and near field measurements. I try to keep all the things equal in terms of volume settings and amp wattage. But the fact of the matter is these microphones have different sensitivities 
and the measurements will need to be adjusted slightly. Don't worry, we are interested in the frequency response curve shape and not the absolute decibel number. Let's get into it. So here we have all the responses of the microphones. Uh, I have far field and near field measurement, but we are going to use only the far field measurements because they are quite conclusive. And you can see here that I written Presonus. This is my uh, audio interface because I measured with the Presonus and the Focusrite uh, audio interface, but there is no difference between them. And FF means far field, NF means near field. So first thing first, we're gonna compare the new Earthworks microphone. This is the brand new one. Uh, we are not interested in how this response looks. This is a far field measurement and it includes the room response as well. So uh, it's normal that we have uh, peaks and dips all over the place. We're just going to compare it with the uh, in first case we are going to compare it with the old earthworks and we are going to consider the new earthworks microphone as the benchmarks as the benchmark because it is the most expensive and is a, a brand new microphone so let's compare it to the old one and uh, we can see that the responses they basically overlap except in the various very high octave so above 10 kilohertz we can see there is a bit of a difference so this is like two decibels so above 10k uh, above 10 kilohertz uh, as the microphone ages we can see it it gets a little bit hot let's say um, and the response is like plus 2 dB in the upper octave. Now let's uh, switch this off and compare the Dayton audio microphone. This is also an old microphone, even older than the Earthworks. So I think it's like seven years old. And uh, we can see then in the bottom octave, we also have some discrepancies. Quite significant, if I might add. So two decibels plus maybe. And of course, in the upper octave, we also have these discrepancies and some stuff going on over here. So even worse than, well, it's to be expected. This is older and also a cheaper microphone. So now let's compare it to the cheapest microphone without uh, a calibration fire, the Behringer uh, microphone. And we seem to get, uh, uh, bear in mind this is a brand new microphone, so we still get the discrepancy in the lower octave, which is not good. And uh, the difference is uh, in the higher octave is quite significant. So 57 and this is 61, so four decibels difference. And this difference starts to happen 4k I guess 4k 5k so it starts even lower it's fine in the middle region but the extremities uh, are, are are bad so the lower octave and the higher octave but starting with 4k 5k it starts to get worse and it progressively gets worse as you get the higher higher in the frequency spectrum so not looking good for the Behringer microphone. Now let's check the USB mic. So the UMIC, UMIC 1. And wouldn't you know it, this one looks pretty good. Again, I want to mention that this is a brand new microphone and no problem in the lower octave. And in the higher octave, it looks pretty good. I mean, there should be some variance, I guess. But this looks pretty small like only one decibel so I'm, uh, this is a good microphone I'm, I'm 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 recommending it i just don't like how uh, it works as a usb mic i prefer i prefer an xlr mic 
if I have to choose. But this USB mic is quite good when it comes to measurement accuracy. As you can see, what separates a good mic from a bad one or an old one from a new one is the response at the extremities. The upper octave response starts to get worse and then the lower octave. Depending on how old or how poor the performance of the mic is, the upper octave becomes the last two octaves. So the last two octaves are worse, like with the Behringer microphone. The response starts to degrade, uh, starting with the 5 kHz range, which is pretty bad. Now you are probably wondering, why would I pay so much for a microphone if the performance difference is underwhelming? So comparing to a brand new U mic, uh, or maybe a brand new Dayton Audio mic, which I suspect is pretty good, but don't have one for test, the differences are small. So that's a good question. The answer is mostly found in the specs of the microphone. For example, the Earthworks mic can measure from 3 Hz to 23 kilohertz, while the Dayton Audio has a frequency range from 18 Hz to 20 kilohertz. So if measuring home theater subwoofers is your thing, you need to pay attention to what mic you choose. Another thing that uh, sets them apart is the Max SPL. The Earthworks mic can handle 140 decibels. And a typical mic can only do 127 or 130 decibels. And the difference is significant. Most of the time, these improved specs don't matter. So I highly recommend to just buy a modest mic that comes with a calibration file. The Dayton Audio MMM6 fits that category perfectly. Couple it with a two-channel audio interface and you got yourself a nice measurement setup. Your mic one is also a good measurement microphone if you don't do acoustic timing measurements or you don't mind the extra hassle for doing such measurements. In the end, after watching this video, I hope you can make a more informed decision on what microphone you want or need. That's it for today. See you next time. Peace.